had a couple hours, and I said, good, because you know what we have to look at? Really, I, I'm going to warn you, I'm not going to try to keep you here all night. I won't hold you hostage. But the reality is this lesson is really about three lessons. So if we were doing this as a series, it would take about, you know, two and a half hours to present. We're going to do it in a lot less time than that. But before we get to the handout, we are talking about what the world needs now, and we're going to be emphasizing purpose. The world needs a clear purpose regarding life. What are we doing here? What's the meaning of life? What is our purpose? Well, I hope tonight that we can say some things that will challenge all of us, and again, through the Word of God, supply us once again, remind us regarding what our purpose is here upon this earth. But as we think about this title, it's a tremendous title. I'm sure somebody other than Mike came up with this, didn't they? <laughs> Foy, are you responsible for this one too? <laughs> you know? But it, it's a tremendous title. It's, it's very, very timely. What the world needs now, you know, you go back just a few months, and what the world was clamoring about, what the world said we needed, was a remedy. We need relief. We need a vaccine for COVID-19. I'm very thankful that we have one. Maybe this world now will say, you know, I'm not thinking exclusively about that pandemic. Maybe now we can show here's what the world really needs. Amen. And I want you to think about this. Again, we're talking about a need, what the world needs. And we're talking about an urgent need. This is what the world needs now. And we're talking about a universal need. Again, this is what the world, the whole world needs. You know what's sad? What the world needs, and I'm talking about really needs, they don't want. You remember the prodigal? He only needed the father. And I guess in his youthful exuberance, he Forgot that, ignored that. Now, at least he came to his senses and said, I want my father. I'm going home. But what he really needed, he didn't want it one time, did he? And what the world wants, they do not need. Think about King Ahab. I want Naboth's vineyard. He didn't need that. Naboth said, that's part of my inheritance. I cannot give it to you. It cost him his life. But what the world wants, they don't need. And I'll guarantee you this. Whatever the world truly needs, God has already provided it for us. In his wisdom, in his benevolence, he knows what we need. Remember David, Psalm 23 and verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My shepherd, the kind of shepherd I has have. He's, he's looking out for me. He's supplying my needs. Remember Philippians 4 and verse 19, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's confidence. As they gave to him, and remember they didn't have a lot to give, but as they gave to him, they might be thinking, well, we're giving to supply his needs. Who's going to take care of us? Paul said, I have the answer. My God, He'll supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You remember the language of Romans 8 and verse 32? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? The promise we have that God will supply our needs is the fact that he's giving us, he's already given us the greatest thing we needed in Christ Jesus, his beloved son. And if he has provided for our greatest need, he certainly will provide for our lesser needs, won't he? And so what the world needs now, purpose. Look at your study sheet, if you will. Look what we have here. This introduction is just the word purpose and a definition for purpose. Look what it says. Here's what we're talking about. We're talking about what the world needs. They need purpose. We need purpose. Well, what is purpose? Here it is. The reason for which something exists 
or is done, made, used, etc. The reason for which something is made, something is used. You know, a story was told not too long ago, and it reminded us about something that happened not too many years ago. Several companies and several individuals banded together to provide for those who were cold and in need. And what they decided to do was to make scarves for individuals. And they made these scarves and they put them in different locations. They would put them on a fence. They would wrap them around a telephone pole. Uh, these scarves were just left there and many of them came with a note attached to the scarf. Now here's what one of the notes said on one of the scarves. Listen to this. It said, I'm not lost. If you're cold, I'm yours. Now hear this. I was made for you to take. The scarf knew and understand its purpose. Why? Because the very one who made the scarf had written instructions. I was made for you. What's the point here? We also have a maker. We have a creator. And we should understand our purpose because likewise our creator has spelled out our purpose for us. There's no question what I'm here for. There's no question what you exist for. Solomon, in defeating secularism in the book of Ecclesiastes, he held the meaning until the very end of the book. He explored everything. Is life, do we find meaning, meaning through an intellectual approach? The end of chapter 1 and his conclusion, no, we can't figure it out. It's vanity, striving after the whim. Chapter 2 opens up when he says, hey, let's forget trying to figure this all out intellectually. Let's just bathe ourselves with pleasure. The sensual attempt. You know what his response was on that? This is vanity. This is striving after the wind. This doesn't tell me what we're here for either. And so the third attempt in chapter 2, the materialistic attempt. I'll just acquire everything I can and maybe this will help me understand what I'm here for. You remember again, his response was the same. This is vanity. It's striving after the wind. Now, if we are interested enough to follow Solomon through the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, he'll tell us at the end what purpose is, what meaning is, what direction we should follow. The conclusion when all is heard is fear God and keep his commandments. Remember, this is the whole of man. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. I should know my purpose for being here. You should know your purpose well, to reinforce that purpose tonight, look what we have on your study sheet. We have what we're entitling, Parable of a Man Who Had Forgotten His Purpose. We're going to go to Luke, the 12th chapter, begin in verse 13, go through verse 21. And here's what's so interesting to me about this parable. Jesus is about to use a fool to teach us about purpose. He's about to use a fool. I don't know if you think you're wise or not, but I'll tell you what. Even a wise man and a truly wise man can learn from anyone. Go back to the book of Proverbs. The ant, the sluggard. Solomon intends for us to learn lessons from creation, from nature. Even the sluggard who is condemned. And if we're truly wise, we can learn from anyone, even a fool. But the sad thing is, fools will not learn from anyone, not even the wise. So I hope we're truly wise tonight. Because if so, we can learn something from a fool. And no, I'm not talking about myself. You know, Mike's jumping on that, I think, in his mind right now. That's, that's good, Ken. You know, no, let's look at this. We're going to read Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Follow along with me, if you will. It says in verse 13, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. 
Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Here's a man, as we've suggested, who forgot his purpose for life. He forgot his purpose for being here. We're going to move through this section very quickly. I hope you brought something to write with. Just fill in these blanks, and again, you can flesh this out in your own study a little bit with more detail later. But keep this in mind, again, he had forgotten God. Let's begin there. He had forgotten God. You know, the problem was not that he had no place to store his goods. That's what he says in verse 18. No place for his goods. The problem was he had no place in his room for God. That was this man's problem. Secondly, notice this. He had forgotten others. He'd forgotten his fellow man. This man had been blessed plentifully, bountifully, so much so that his old barns were no longer sufficient. He says, I, I can't put them there. Too much surplus. I'll have to tear them down and make new barns. Well, there were places where he could have stored those goods. He could have kept those old barns. They had worked, obviously, previously, for many years for him. And so he could have stored his barn, I mean, his goods in the widow's house. He could have been generous to her. He could have shared at the orphan's table. He could have shared with those who are poor and destitute. Oh, there's always a place to store our goods. But this man had forgotten God, and this man had forgotten others, his fellow man. Notice the next point. He'd forgotten his purpose in life. Friend, our purpose, and I'm talking about our real purpose, not the self-imagined purpose, not the self-invented purpose, but our real purpose is to glorify God and to help our fellow man. Is that not what Jesus was all about? They asked Jesus, what's the first, the foremost commandment? Jesus says, well, I'll tell you. The first, the foremost, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And it's almost as if Jesus is saying, while we're on this subject, the second is to love your fellow man, your neighbor, as yourself. You see, that's the purpose. He'd forgotten God. He'd forgotten others. He'd forgotten his purpose in life. Look at this next point. He'd forgotten his stewardship. You know, a steward, biblically speaking, is someone left entrusted with another man's possessions. And whether we'll admit it or not, we're all stewards before God. This idea, look what I have accomplished, look what I have accumulated, it's only God's blessings. He's been gracious and kind to every one of us. I am his steward. I'm left with another man's possession. But this man had forgotten that stewardship. You remember 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2? It's required that a steward be found faithful. One of these days, we're all going to stand before God. And God's going to want to know, Ken, what did you do with all the blessings I bestowed upon you? You were a steward of what I gave you. How would you use it? You're going to stand there also and answer that question. Let's not forget our stewardship. Look at this next point. He'd forgotten the deceitfulness of riches. 
You know, that's the very language Jesus uses in Matthew 13 and verse 22. He talks about the deceitfulness of riches. We need to understand that God views and judges wealth differently than we do. This world sees someone with money signs beside their name, a big bankroll, a big bank account, a lot of houses, cars. They think that man's rich. God doesn't view wealth, riches as we do, does he? You know, God looks at the heart. Remember, remember 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. There's too many times in the Bible. Remember the congregation in Revelation 2, Smyrna? Jesus, speaking to them, said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Now, the world wouldn't say that about that congregation. They'd say, I see it's struggling, it's having tribulation, and I see it's very poor. Jesus said, oh, I, I know you're poor, but you are rich. You know what's interesting? The very next chapter, Smyrna is the poor, rich congregation. But in Revelation 3, we're introduced to the rich, poor congregation, the Laodiceans. You know, if you go back in history, Laodicea was devastated. It was completely annihilated almost by an earthquake. They were so wealthy, they rebuilt the city of Laodicea with any help, without any help from Rome. That's how wealthy they were. And so in Revelation 3 and verse 17, they said we're rich. We're in need of nothing. We become wealthy. And the Lord in that same verse said you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You think you're rich? You're not rich at all, not rich toward God. And so again, this man had forgotten the deceitfulness of riches. And notice, he'd forgotten the brevity of life. We're not here for long, are we? You know, the older I grow, become, that becomes a fact of life that I guess we really tune into. You know, what is your life? It's even a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanisheth away. James 4 and verse 14. Life is short-lived. You know, in Psalm 90, you know, we might live 70 years or if due to strength, 80. So teach us to number our days that we might apply unto thee a heart of wisdom. When I'm wise, really wise, I realize I'm not going to be here long. And even if I can stay here 80 or 90 years in view of eternity, that is nothing. That is a vapor. He'd forgotten the brevity of life. In fact, remember as we read through this context, there's a contrast in verses 19 and 20. He has just told himself that he had much good laid up for many years. That's his language. Many years. Remember the next verse? God says, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. And notice this last one here. He'd forgotten the certainty of death. Life is short. Death is sure. Do you remember in 2 Kings 20 and verse 1 what Hezekiah was told? Set your house in order, for you will die and not live. Now, of course, in the context there, he's going to be, God will add 15 years because he said, I heard your prayer and I've seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. But again, set your house in order. That's great advice. Why set my house? He's not talking about the physical house. He's talking about our spiritual house. Set it in order. Why? You're going to die, Ken. You're not going to live forever. It's appointed on the man who wants to die. And after that judgment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. So here is a fool that can teach a wise man. Here are things that he's forgotten. Now let's do this very quickly. Let's go back through here and look at the tragic result of a life without purpose. That's what we're looking at here. A life without purpose. 
I don't know if he understood his purpose prior to his great bountiful harvest. We're not told that. All I know is that when he's blessed immensely, he forgets everything. But notice this. Notice this now. In the first three verses, we're going to read in just a moment, Luke 12, verses 13 through 15. And this first statement here, fill this in, and I think you'll see it as we go back and look at this. But this man, he is asking, he's asking, fill in the blank with asking, but not receiving. He's asking, but he's not receiving. Take your Bibles, go back and look at this with me. I like, I think it was Herbert Lockyer in his series, his books of all, all the kings of the Bible, all the last words of the Bible, all the parables of the Bible. It's in his book, All the Parables of the Bible. In some place, it's not in connection with Luke 12 here, this parable. But in another place, he says the key to the parable hangs on the door. And what he's saying is so many times in the parables of Jesus, if you want to know why he you know, started teaching the parable, just look at the context. Here's a perfect example. Why did Jesus, in verse 16, go on to start teaching about that rich farmer who was a fool? Here's why. The key to the parable it's right here, hanging on the door, right before you begin the parable. Look at verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. You know, Luke 12 begins in verse 1 with Jesus in this context, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You beware of hypocrisy. Now, you beware of covetousness. He is teaching, and a man so oblivious to what Jesus is all about. Jesus is not about things. Jesus is not about money. Remember, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Luke 9, verse 58. But here's this man, and Jesus is teaching, and it seems like he interrupts him and says, Teacher, I want you to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, Jesus is about to set that man straight and everyone in the audience. I'm not your judge. I'm not an arbitrator. And besides all that, you better beware of the very attitude with which you ask that. Beware of covetousness. He's trying to tell the man, even if you have abundance, your life doesn't consist of your possessions. You know what's interesting? One chapter or two chapters earlier, you remember Martha? She's doing the same thing this man is doing. And we better be careful lest we ever do this. But this man says, I want you to tell my brother. You tell my brother something. Martha says, I want you to tell my sister to come and help me. They're telling Jesus what to do. We've got things backwards, do we not? No, he doesn't, he doesn't respond to what I tell him to do. I respond, if I'm wise, to what he has commanded. Remember what Mary said in John 2 and verse 5, whatever he says to you, do it. That's great advice. But this man is asking, but he's not receiving. Now, that sort of changes the general rule. Jesus previously in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7, says, Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Well, you say, Jesus, you said that. And this man's asking, but he's not receiving. Well, remember James, the fourth chapter, verse 2. You have not because you ask not. And then verse 3, you ask, but you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your lusts. That's why this man is asking, but not receiving. He's asking about something Jesus said, man, I don't even get into that. I'm not to judge. I'm not the arbitrator. 
But I will tell you this, beware of the spirit that confronts me and tells me to tell your brother to give you some money. So he's asking, but he's not receiving. Look at the next point here. The next point, we're going to read verse 16 and verse 21, but fill in these blanks. He is wealthy, but he's not rich. He's wealthy, but he's not rich. Look at verse 16. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Now you might say, well, Ken, hold on now. The Bible says he is rich. Jump to the end of this context with me again. Look at verse 21. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Oh, he's rich as far as the world considers riches, but he's not rich towards God. I don't care to be rich as the world views riches, but I'll tell you one thing. I want to be rich in God's eyes. It's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. Proverbs 10 and verse 22. Go back to those two congregations in Revelation 2 and 3. There is a poor, rich congregation. There's a rich, poor congregation. What is rich in Christ's eyes? One is poor, even though they have abundance. This man is wealthy, but he's not rich towards God. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. He's laying up for himself treasures on earth. And you know what happens. Those are going to rust. They're going to corrode. The possibility of thieves breaking in and stealing them. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This man is rich on earth. He's bankrupt toward God. How sad. Look at this next point here. He is thinking, but he's not thoughtful. He is thinking, but he's not thoughtful. Look at the first part of the very next verse, verse 17. It says, and he thought within himself. Stop right there. So he thought within himself. He's thinking all right, but he's not thoughtful. He's thinking about how he can keep all of this bounty. How he can keep all of this bounty plentiful harvest he's thinking but he's not thoughtful towards others is he he has no concern as we've already said for the widow no concern for the orphans no concern for the poor for the destitute for those who are in dire need he's thinking but he's not thoughtful you know one thing this lesson teaches us is let's be more thoughtful one to another We're not here to hoard up riches. And remember, you're not going to take anything with you, are you? It's been wisely stated you have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. That's not going to happen. You're not taking it with you. It's all going to stay. story was told of a very wealthy man, and he passed, and his friends gathered at the visitation. One was heard to ask, I wonder how much he left. And the other said he left it all. (laughs) That's what we're going to do. We're going to leave it all. And so, again, he's thinking, but he's not thoughtful. Look at this next point. He is doing, but he's not a doer. He is doing, but he's not a doer. Go to the second part. We'll call it 17b. Remember, it began with, and he thought within himself. Now notice this, saying, what shall I do? Notice, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? In verse 18, the beginning of it, so he said, I will do this. He is doing, but he's not a doer. Not in the sense the Bible challenges us. You know, Satan's always working. Satan is always active. Satan himself is a doer, or at least he's doing, but he's not a doer in God's sight. He's not about the Father's business, Luke 2 and verse 49, and nor is this man. He's doing, but he's not a doer. We're not to be hearers only of the word, but doers 
Remember James 1, verse 22? And remember what Jesus said in John 13 after he washes the disciples' feet? He gives them an example. And he says, if you know these things, blessed are ye if you do them. Notice, that's what a doer is. We know, hopefully, God's word and we do it. Jesus didn't say, if you know these things, you're blessed. He didn't say that. Now, it is true. We have to know before we can do. But Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you, happy are you, if you do them. So we're not blessed simply for knowing. It's for knowing and doing. This man is doing, but he's not a doer. Look at this next point here. He is planning but he's not prepared. Oh, he's got a lot of great plans. You think someone who's planning is going to be prepared. You know, you go on vacation, you have all these plans, and you, you work out those plans, and you're planning, and thus you're prepared. You hit the road, and, you know, it's not like I forgot this, I forgot that. That's what planning is good for. It prepares us. This man is planning, but he's not prepared. He's not prepared for life. He's certainly not prepared for death. Read with me the verse we put down here. Verse 18, the last part of it. We'll read all of it right now. But in verse 18, so he said, I will do this. And now notice his plan. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. Oh, he's got great plans. Those barns that serviced me well, <laughs> they can't handle what I had this, this harvest. I'll, I'll get rid of them. I'll pull them down. I'll build new ones. Planning, but not prepared. You know, that's how this world is going to be caught on the day of judgment, isn't it? Oh, we've got great plans. James talks about this. We're not to say, I'll go into the city and I'll do this and I'll make this. And he says, rather, you should say, if the Lord wills. That's the key, isn't it? Daily in our lives. Oh, make plans. It's not talking about not making plans. But you make plans spiritually. And help those plans make you prepare for this life and the life which is to come. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Look at this next point. He is at ease, but he's not at rest. Verse 19. Look what it says here. Verse 19. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Notice that. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. He's at ease, but he's not at rest. What did Jesus say in Matthew 20? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. Now there the rest. Or that's Matthew 11 and verse 28. But the rest there. That's rest from our sin. That's rest. I'll give rest unto your soul. That's soul rest. We're not going to rest from our labors until Revelation 13, 14 right from now on. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They'll rest from their labors. Their works follow after them. So I have rest when I come to Jesus because he forgives me of sin. But I'm not resting in his kingdom. Remember Matthew 21 and verse 28, what he taught? Son, go work today in my vineyard. Don't ever think, hey, I came to Christ and now my ticket is punched and I don't have to do anything. I'm just at ease. Life's not about being at ease, friend. Life is about helping someone who has it difficult to ease their burden, to ease their pain. That's part of the purpose of life. So he's at ease, but he's not at rest. And notice this last point. He has provided, but he has nothing. He has provided, but he has nothing. Read it again, the last two verses. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have 
provided. Notice, he's provided, but he has nothing. He's a pauper before God. And so look at verse 21. Don't ever forget this verse. This ties everything together. After God says this to that man, you're a fool. Tonight your soul is required of you. Now, who's going to have all those things you provided? He goes on to say, so is he. Now, you might, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, you might even add the point that Jesus is making. So is he a fool. Anyone else who acts like this farmer, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. He's provided, but he has nothing. What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Mark 8 and verse 36. You know, when you look at this man, he's a man without purpose. Thus, he's a man without peace, isn't he? He's at ease, but not at rest. This man right here, he talks about his barns, but he ought to be preparing for a burial. That's what's happening. He talks about his food, but he ought to be preparing for a funeral. He talks about his goods, but he ought to be preparing for the grave. Because that's where he's headed. The sad thing about this man, it's, it's like what we said about the prodigal earlier. The prodigal needed the father, but he thought he wanted and needed the far distant country. Oh, he came to his senses, came back to the father. No doubt he rejoiced finding his greatest need. But once again, this man was more concerned about a barn than he was a mansion. You think about that. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Friend, what do you want in life? What do you want out of life? Are we like this rich fool? Are we more concerned about a barn than a mansion? I understand that word in the original language. It doesn't mean some spacious spread, some castle. It's really translated room. In my father's house are many rooms. He can accommodate everyone who wills to do his will. But here's a man so caught up in this world, in this life, forgetting his purpose. Again, he's concerned about a barn and not a mansion, not his heavenly home. Maybe this afternoon we've said something that makes you think about your own life. I hope so. Hopefully everything's good. Maybe you've looked into your own heart and you say, you know, there are some things that I need to repent of and these were sins that I've committed publicly. I need to repent publicly. Maybe there are things that you can take care of as Jesus said, you go home and you go to your closet and you pray about these things. But friend, let's get our lives right. Again, this man thought he had many years and God says, let me correct that. You don't have many years. This night, this night your soul is required of you. And it could be tonight that my soul is. It could be that your soul is. I know this. If that's true, we want to be prepared. The only way we'll be prepared is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've never obeyed him, let's start thinking very seriously about that, even right now. If you're not living like you should as a child of God, then let's repent of that tonight. If you have need to respond to our Lord's invitation, won't you come as we stand together and sing?